Hi everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Charles Lipson, Professor Emeritus at the University of Chicago. Recently, as we all know, Hunter Biden has agreed to a plea deal on tax and gun charges. And this comes as House Republicans have been investigating the business dealings of Hunter Biden and the rest of the Biden family. You recently penned an op-ed entitled, Are the Walls Closing In on Old Joe? Can you explain this for us? How and why would the walls be closing in? Well, we're getting more and more evidence, both that the family grifting operation involved a lot of family members, which makes it harder for uh, President Biden to say that he knew absolutely nothing about it, which he has done repeatedly. And he has also said he did nothing to advance it. The charges that Hunter has uh, been, uh, has pled to look extremely light and look like charges that could have been filed within a month rather than taking five years during which the statute of limitations ran out on a lot of things. What's new now, Brittany, is that we have statements from whistleblowers in the IRS who look extremely credible and non-political saying that when their investigation of Hunter Biden began to touch on Joe Biden, they were blocked at every turn. Those statements, plus the statements that I believe six people in the room heard from the um, U.S. Attorney for Delaware, David Weiss, that he was not ultimately in charge of deciding where and what to file are directly in contradiction to statements made by Attorney General Merrick Garland, including statements under oath and statements made by David Weiss later. We need to sort that out and we need to do it under under oath. I do want to talk about that whistleblower a little more. The IRS whistleblower testified that the DOJ slow walked its investigation into the president's son and gave him preferential treatment based on who his dad was. So first, what do we know about this whistleblower and how credible are they? Well, the first thing I want to say is that for most Americans, uh, it's perfectly fine that dad wants to help a troubled son. I, I completely understand that. I think most Americans do. What uh, is inconsistent here is the president inviting him to a state dinner, making a statement in a, in a televised interview that his son did nothing wrong, when the president, of course, is the head of the executive branch, including the Justice Department, and then inviting him to, to uh, Camp David while he has all these charges, uh, serious uh, though they are, uh, uh, pending uh, against him. They also contradict the idea that Hunter was capable in some way of earning all the money that he received. If they're going to say he was deeply impaired, he was a drug addict, he really couldn't do anything, he's not responsible, then why are they paying him $80,000 a month from here and there? It's all, but, but the main point here is Hunter is in a sense, not important in and of himself. He's not an elected official. He's only important if what he um, was involved in, said or did, uh, touches on the President of the United States and statements that the President has made. That's why the whistleblowers' uh, uh, statements and testimony uh, are so important. He, to me, he looks perfectly credible. I'm sure that the Washington media, which is out to discredit him and the mainstream media, will do as they have been, which is not to investigate the underlying charges, but to see what they can do to damage the person who brought them forward. I want to talk about the idea that has come up a lot, which is the smoking gun. The thing that definitively connects President Biden to these payments, to these business dealings that show that they are illegal or show that his foreign policy was in some way influenced. And as of now, Republicans don't have that smoking gun. But in your opinion, what does that smoking gun look like? What is it? Well, it would, first of all, uh, it's unclear if we will ever get a smoking gun, 
um, in, in this case. Um, it would look like money uh, that Hunter Biden received also went to Joe Biden. It would look like uh, people were uh, able to testify that Joe Biden was in some sense not only knowledgeable about but supportive of Hunter's dealings. We already have some of that testimony. We have it from Tony Bobolinsky, for example, who met twice with Joe Biden with Hunter present in, uh, when there were dealings that involved his business. Uh, that testimony has never been discredited. Uh, but um, I think that um, it's always puzzling to me, in a sense, how uh, some of the media go after one candidate, some go after the other, and some of the charges, the legal charges that are brought, are to me not, uh, they may be the most provable, but they're not the most serious. And I'll give you an example. To me, although serious though it is, if um, pre former President Donald Trump held documents that he should not have held, and if he obstructed justice by uh, claiming he returned them, which is really part of the charges against him. Serious though those charges are, to me, they are less serious than the fact that he uh, has failed in his most fundamental duty as a constitutional official in a democracy, which is to either acknowledge his defeat in an election or to prove that he was fraudulently kept from office. He has not proved that he was fraudulently kept from office. And as recently as last week in an interview with uh, Brett Baer on Fox News, uh, Donald Trump continues to say that he uh, did not lose the 2020 election. He, they, there may be charges brought, but whether they are or not, to me, that's the deepest uh, problem. And the deepest problem with uh, the Biden issues are that whether or not they find a smoking gun, it to me is incredible that all of Hunter and uh, James uh, and much of James Biden, the president's brother's income, plus money that went to the grandchildren and all the rest, uh, uh, the daughter-in-law, all of that, or most of it, nearly all of it, came from countries that Barack Obama had made Joe Biden the chief foreign policy person in charge of Ukraine, dealing with China, dealing with Romania. And Hunter Biden engaged in very lucrative deals. And in some of those deals, Brittany, he flew back. He flew in on Air Force Two, a clear signal to the people uh, in those countries that he was politically very well connected. And he flew back for 20 plus hours on Air Force Two from China with his father. And the father is saying, I, I have no idea what he did while he was there. I think that really does bring me to my next question, which has been the response from Democrats, because I've right. talked to a Democrat in Congress and I said, you know, you're saying that there's no smoking gun. This isn't illegal, but there's that question of ethical. Is it is this ethical? And they said, well, I'm not the ethics committee. So I want to talk about the responses from Democrats, because really they are in two camps. One is hey, it's not illegal, there's nothing definitively connecting President Biden to these business dealings, to anything illegal, to anything that influences foreign policy. And then the other camp of, well, pointing the finger at former President Trump, well, what about former President Trump? What about his family? What do you make of these responses? Well, I don't like the idea of that uh, Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, uh, made billions of dollars, uh, it looks like, from areas where um, the, uh, the Trump administration was deeply involved in the Middle East. On the other hand, um, Jared Kushner himself was deeply involved in those negotiations. He helped execute uh, the, Ab the Abraham Accords, a term which, by the way, is never mentioned uh, by the Biden administration. The, those uh, those um, connections, which look like grifting to me, 
also are probably not illegal. Moreover, I would say two more things. One is that Jared was known to be kind of out of the president's orbit by the time they left office. He was out uh, uh, of close connection with the president. Indeed, they seem to be opposed to each other in, in many ways. The other thing is that President Trump probably lost money while he was in office. He may have made a little money on the people who wanted to stay at his hotel in Washington, but I don't think he made money in general. He made his money on uh, real estate developments, inheritance from his father and his television shows. If you look at that huge beach house of Joe Biden and so forth, where did he, he had no job other than uh, government uh, work. How did they make all that money? The only way they could have made it was by trading off his name as a family. Whether that's illegal or not, it stinks. What will the Democrats do about it? They'll do nothing about it unless he looks like he can't win a presidential election, in which case they'll begin to attack him so they can get another person into the position. But that won't be an easy matter, not if Joe wants to stand, and not if Kamala Harris wants to remain on the ticket because Democrats need a strong turnout and an almost universal vote from African Americans to win those elections. Do you think that Democrats will speak out anytime soon, or do do you think Joe Biden's a winnable candidate for the Democrats? Depends on who he runs against, and depends on whether his cognitive decline, which seems pretty obvious to me, as well as his physical decline, but especially his cognitive decline, uh, become more obvious to the public. It, it's not at all clear that Trump can beat him. It is very clear that Trump holds a commanding lead among Republicans, and it's been striking how all these charges against Trump have so far not chipped away at the lead. Indeed, the lead has increased. Now, part of that is because Alvin Bragg, who filed the first charges against Trump in New York, filed very thin charges which should never have been filed against a former president. Uh, we say everyone is equal against the law, but when you start attacking people who are the likely candidate for the other party, you need to ha you need to meet a very high standard, lest it begin to look like you are trying to take out political opponents, and that's the underlying problem here. Trump is facing all kinds of charges, many of them quite legitimate, but uh, it looks as if the DOJ has uh, really done everything it can to shelter uh, the former vice president and now the sitting president from any implication in uh, legal charges that might face him. I do want to read you something that Dan Abrams, he's the chief legal correspondent, that he said about Hunter Biden and this plea deal. And I want to get your response. Uh, he said this, if Hunter Biden's name wasn't Biden, he wouldn't have gotten that lucrative gig consulting for Burisma, no doubt about it. But he also likely would not have been charged with the crimes to which he has pled guilty. Those screaming about a double standard simply don't have the evidence at this point to back up those claims. What's your reaction to this? Because we did touch on it a little bit. The I'm not a lawyer and I haven't practiced criminal law, so... Uh, but before deferring to uh, Dan Abrams, who has good judgment in these matters, I'm not criticizing him in any personal way, I've certainly heard a lot of lawyers say something different. And in particular, they say that the job of the, uh, of the Justice Department prosecutors is always to go for the highest level of provable allegations. And what we have here are a whole series, for example, of tax allegations which were never brought forward. And uh, the IRS people are saying it's much more than, uh, it's not what the Biden people have been saying that, oh, he just filed a little late and he ultimately paid everything. They're saying there were huge amounts of unpaid 
taxes and that the amounts were much larger. So it may be that this slap on the wrist for these charges, which could have been done basically five years ago, uh, that Abrams is right about that, but that doesn't mean that those are the only charges that could have been brought against Hunter Biden, and the favoritism uh, looks pretty bad there. I wonder if those charges will be rejected by um, the uh, judge on July 26 when the case uh, comes forward. Now, the judge cannot uh, require an independent investigation, and she can't require the prosecutors to bring different charges. Uh, that's an independent branch of government. That's the executive branch that brings those. She's the judicial branch. But she can reject the charges, and that would uh, put a huge fire under the pot in the Justice Department. And I expect that the House Committee, which has subpoena power, uh, plus uh, Ron Johnson and Chuck Grassley in the Senate, who do not have subpoena power, but who do have uh, people coming to them, whistleblowers, uh, will continue this investigation. And I don't think we've heard the last of this by, by any means. I, I would also say that the media's role in general, the mainstream media's role, has been just atrocious here. They should be all over the investigation of this, as they have been in the Trump case. There's no reason why they're not. They've asked a few questions. There are a few stories. The New York Times ran one about the WhatsApp message uh, where Hunter threatened the Chinese business associate, uh, saying, my father's in the room. We don't know if the father was in the room. Uh, we do know that Hunter got $5.1 million from that message. And uh, and that was far from the only uh, money that he got. And according to the whistleblowers, they wanted to find out if his father was in the room and could have done that with uh, geolocation uh, information about Joe Biden's phone, and they were denied that uh, possibility. The whistleblowers have also said that they wanted to interview a number of people and raid uh, a location where Hunter kept documents and that uh, that was leaked to Hunter's lawyers um, um, by the executive branch and that all that was cleared out and that most of the people they were unable to get a hold of and interview. It stinks. I mean, that's the only thing. Whether there's a smoking gun, there's something that smells really bad about all of this. Which makes me ask my next question is, do you think this stinks enough for American voters who see this all laid out? And do you think that will make them not want to vote for Joe Biden based on his family's business dealings, Hunter Biden, because Hunter Biden was a factor in 2020 and that and Joe right. Biden did win? If Joe Biden ran unopposed, he would lose. If uh, Donald Trump ran unopposed, he would lose. If they run against each other, it's anybody's bet. But uh, uh, Hunter, uh, Hunter Biden is an albatross around Joe's neck. And as I uh, have said before, it's not Hunter in his own right. But Joe has clearly signaled that he's closely tied to Hunter, uh, inviting him to state dinners to and so forth while he's already pled, pled guilty, including led to a felony, it's a pretty serious signal to people in the executive branch what he wants done. We talked about President Biden at length. We also talked about President or former President Trump. And one of my colleagues has been tracking the investigations and lawsuits into the former president. And the last I checked, they were up upwards of over 40. So what do you think this says that these two are the front runners for the nation's highest office? It says a lot and nothing good about American politics. The first thing it says is that we are, uh, at least at the level of organized politics, very much divided into two parties. And what's new, I think, Brittany, you're far younger than I am, but it used, our politics used to not be so ideological. Now it's deeply ideological. And that means 
if you're on the other side, uh, you increasingly are not only viewed as wrong, but is somehow beneath moral contempt. I mean, I see this all the time. You see Republicans thinking that Democrats, their views on abortion or their views on schooling or whatever it is, they're just beneath contempt. And you see Democrats seeing the same thing about Republicans. And I see it all the time. And they're looking, I mean, it's just really hard. I, I, I write a lot and I am quite willing to write about flaws on both sides. I don't view my job when I write op-eds and the like uh, as looking for the fallout and saying if it hurts quote my candidate then I won't write it and if it helps my candidate then I will. I don't do that. I try to write truthfully and fairly. Okay? And that leads that leads to people who sort of generally taking your side, my side on a lot of issues, saying, I just don't want to receive your emails anymore, you're contemptible, this and that and the other. I may be contemptible, but not for that reason. <laughs> I want to quote your op-ed, another quote, and then I want you to react a little bit and elaborate for us. You write this, you don't have to choose between the allegations against Biden and Trump. And I think that speaks perfectly to your point, because I think people who might be Republicans won't speak out against the former president. Likewise, with Democrats, won't speak out against the current president. Can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Well, yes. I mean, if you're an elected official or if you're running for office, you you really have very strong incentives to remain within your silo. I mean, look at how many of the top candidates running, uh, top candidates may be a loose word, running on the Republican side for the presidential nomination are very reluctant to attack Trump. That's partly because they know Trump will attack them back. And just with by calling them names, he won't necessarily make any real arguments against them. He'll just say, you'll, you'll say, well, you're, you've uh, stolen money from my company. And he'll say, well, you're just ugly. You know? <laughs> I mean, what kind of an argument is that? But, but uh, they're also really worried uh, that people who support Trump will go along with him. And that if they get past him, they need those votes. They, they, and they need them if they're running for Congress. They need them if they're running for governor. They need them if they're running for representative. And the same is true on the Democratic side. Uh, vote against Nancy Pelosi, and she cuts off your money from the Democratic National Committee in the past when she was the head of the, uh, of the House uh, Democrats. So, I mean, there's a lot of incentive to stick with it. But that doesn't mean that the people who write editorials for the New York Times, for the Washington Post, uh, for uh, Forbes.com, uh, and all the others that they have to remain within their silo. I think it's their obligation to have integrity on these issues and see, not just say what they think is true, but not just, but uh, pick a variety of issues, not just the issues that favor their candidate. Well, we will leave it there, Professor Lipson. As this continues to unfold, I mean, we still have a year and a half until the election. I hope you come on back and provide your insights. Thank you so much for joining me. What a pleasure, Brittany. I'd be delighted to come back.